This is the Fort Detrick Business Development Office Government Contracting Webinar Series. Today's webinar is How to Get Lucky in Federal Contracting. Hello everyone, my name is Steve Lamberson. I'm a Federal Contractor Business Development Specialist with the Fort Detrick Business Development Office. We are presenting this webinar in conjunction with TargetGov, who happens to be one of our subject matter experts in today's webinar. Before we get started, I have a few webinar notes I'd like to share with you so today's session runs smoothly. We want you to know that we are recording this webinar to make it available to you for future access, 24 hours, 7 days a week, at your convenience. Now, Due to the number of attendees today, we are going to ask you to send your questions in by email. Please send them to ask, that's A-S-K, at fdbdo.com. And by the way, the, that, that, e that email address is at the bottom of each slide that, of the presentation that you, are, that you are viewing. We promise to answer every question asked either during today's live session or if you are hearing this as a recording, you can send in your questions anytime, 24 hours, 7 days a week, and we will, we will reply with a personal answer. If you have any problems while on the, li on the, on the call, uh, on this line, you can call our office. And that number is 301-620-7071. So the next hour is going to be full of great information. So let's get started with the Fort Detrick Business Development Office webinar, How to Get Lucky in Federal Contracting. Now we have two subject matter experts presenting in today's webinar. First we have Gloria, Gloria Larkin of TargetGov. Welcome, Gloria. Thank you, Steve. It's great to be here. <laughs> Gloria is the president of TargetGov. She is the author of the book Basic Guide to Government Contracting and the book Veterans Guide to Government Business, How to Build a Successful Government Contracting Business. Gloria has over 20 years experience in the business development industry. She has been interviewed on MSNBC and quoted in the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, Businessweek.com, The Examiner, Washington Post, and other local and national publications. We also, our second subject matter in today's present, our subject matter expert in today's presentation is Beth Goldstein. Uh, Beth, welcome, and uh, how are you today? I'm good, thanks. Uh, nice to be here today, Steve. <laughs> Terrific. Now, Beth is the business consultant and founder of Marketing Edge Consulting Group. She is the author of the books, The Ultimate Business Small, uh, excuse me, Ultimate Small Business Marketing Toolkit and the book, Lucky by Design. Beth helps companies gain an understanding of how their customers think and what influences their purchasing decisions. Then she applies this knowledge to create targeted business development initi initiatives. Beth, uh, Beth Goldstein, is empowered, she has empowered hundreds of entrepreneurs to successfully grow their companies. So now that we've been introduced both Gloria and Beth, let's begin the webinar. So please take it from here, ladies. Great. Thank you very much. Um, this is Beth, and um, I'm uh, pleased to be here and would like uh, to get started. So first I want to talk about what is today's discussion going to cover. Um, and we're going to begin with what's luck got to do with it. You've all heard that. It's, you know, the phrase in the past. And, and we're going to cover the value and understanding of the concept of luck and what does it mean to a small business. Um, and a lot of that will come from lessons from the, what my recent book, Lucky by Design, which is about small business growth. Then uh, we're going to segue naturally to talking about how to create your own federal contracting lucky opportunities um, and how you can grab those. So if that sounds good with you, let's begin. So a question I've heard asked many times and I definitely have been intrigued by is the concept of, you know, can you actually attract lucky opportunities? Um, and I've always been intrigued by this, but I've often been um, aggravated, to, to be blunt, when people have said to me, oh, I just got lucky and this opportunity fell in my lap, because I really don't believe that things just happen. You know, every now and then, sure, things happen to you, but I do believe you're able to control your own destiny. And so I'm going to share with you a story about how I got started in this path of understanding how luck, business success, and growth are all significantly interconnected and intertwined. In Boston, I teach at Boston University, 
and um, I teach entrepreneurship. And I also run a number of small business training programs. And in a training program I ran in the fall of 2010, the entrepreneurs who were in a high-growth program, so they're already very successful, um, spent 90 days with me developing growth action plans. Um, so fall of 2010 was one before the, uh, we had a horrific winter in Boston where we literally had snow until April. And um, 90 days after the program ended, they were working on the plans they had created. They came back, and they presented where they were and how successful they had been. And one entrepreneur stood up and said, I just got really lucky. The winter was horrible, and because so many people had ice dams, revenue is tripled what it used to be. And they said to him, wait, I'm confused. What do you mean you got lucky because we had such a horrible winter? He was a a contractor. Um, He had done roof repairs and and building construction. He said, oh, well, if I tell you what I did, then you'll understand. He said, the winter was bad, so that was sort of lucky. But I also optimized my website for the words ice dam. So when people were looking to repair their ice dams, boom, there I was. They found me, and now I'm, be, I'm really profitable, way ahead of my goals. And this intrigued me because here he was attributing just some lucky opportunity. What, what he had done was pretty smart. He had optimized his website, and you know what? His competitors hadn't done that. So I started down this path of understanding what happens when you reverse engineer lucky breaks, what really goes on, and what's sort of the story behind the success of entrepreneurs. And that's really what I wrote about in my book. And so I went about doing it by creating a survey. That's how I did my research, because that's actually what I do in my consulting practice. And what I was looking at was understanding what is the role of luck, what happens when you reverse engineer these lucky and unlucky breaks. And so I interviewed um, or did surveys with 200 entrepreneurs and then interviewed many, many more uh, in 12 countries um, around the world. And here's what I found. Turns out that lucky business owners, the people who felt like luck happened to them, good things were going on, were actually more heavily engaged in very key business growth activities, very specific ones, two to three times more often than the rest of the folks who were working hard but weren't necessarily uh, recognizing or seizing these lucky opportunities. So hopefully by now you're intrigued and you're wondering, well, what are these activities? Is Beth going to actually tell us? And yes, I am going to share. And in the next slide you can see, and I will walk you through this, um, everybody is working hard. No doubt about it. Small business owners, if you're trying to grow, perseverance, which is the first column, everybody's doing it. And the way you would read this is, for people who felt luck had a strong impact on their success, those are the folks in red. So 56% of those lucky people were actually working hard, sweat equity, perseverance. The blue line is luck had no impact. So 46% of those people who felt luck had nothing to do with it, they were just working, they were working hard too. So not much of a difference. The difference comes when you look at the other activities. So having a clear value proposition, meaning you understand why customers buy from you and perhaps why they buy from your competitors. You understand what your value and benefit is. 41% of the lucky people as opposed to 29% of the uh, no, not so lucky people were, were definitely engaged in defining very clearly their value proposition. Okay, so now the margin, oh, it's, it's starting to get larger, but it gets larger as we continue looking at the other activities. Looking at ex- expanding sales, 41% of the lucky people were out there heavily engaged in sales activity, especially through recessionary times and so not just in good times, as opposed to 17% of the folks who weren't impacted by any lucky opportunities. Product development. Four times more often, so 24% of the lucky people were actually developing new products as opposed to 7% of the rest of the folks. 22% of the lucky people were doing market research as opposed to 7%. And the same with business plans. 20% of the folks 
who were lucky actually had a business plan as opposed to seven. Now, I will still tell you that 20% is a very low number to have a business plan, but still, that's three times more than the folks who weren't um, achieving lucky opportunities. They weren't getting those breaks. So what does this tell you? What's it mean for you? You have to work smart, not just hard. Sweat equity is not enough. You absolutely have to be doing the right activities. And what are those right activities? It's understanding your value proposition. It's expanding sales and product development. It's conducting market research, understanding your audience and your perspective, and having a business plan, a plan in place that gets you to where you want to be going. So as you see this uh, lovely woman who actually I think is in menopause, I'm really not sure if this is a sweat equity picture, but hopefully it will make you think next time when you're working really hard, you'll sit and ask yourself, am I working hard? Am I working smart? Am I doing the right activities or am I just putting many, many hours in? Because you know what? If you're putting that many hours in and you're not getting to the goal and you haven't set a clear goal, going to be really hard to end up where you want to be. So what's this mean? Luck isn't random. You cannot, um, you cannot really control, uh, is, is, if luck is random, you can't control your destiny. But luck is, isn't random. What basically happens is you take control of the destiny, and if you remove yourself from that, if you just let things happen, you won't get to where you want to be. So you've probably heard the phrase, you know, preparation and opportunity is really what luck is all about. It's true. If you prepare yourself, if you do the right planning, the right set of activities, you'll not only be able to recognize these opportunities that are surrounding you all the time, but just as important, you'll be able to actually seize them. And that's the key. If you're not doing product development, if you're not researching, if you're not expanding your sales effort, you're not going to be able to grab opportunities when they appear. So with that, I always love to know, you know, how people are preparing. How many of you have a written plan? No, I'm not talking about an investment-grade plan that, you know, you can show to a bank because while those plans have value, it needs to be a plan that you're following very carefully. It needs to be a plan that's actionable. So sometimes I was actually just in a session yesterday, and I asked the room, and there were about 125 people, and I asked them, how many of you have a business plan? And I would tell you, about 85% of them raised their hand. And then I asked, well, how many of you actually follow it as if it's something that is important to your business? And half of them put their hands down, which was, which was sad because they had this great plan. And while the, there's value in creating a plan, there's a lot more value in actually following it. So the book that I wrote is about what are you, the activities you need to do, market research, product development, sales, and your unique value proposition. And those all need to be supported by your roadmap. So now we're going to talk about market research. What does market research mean to you as a small business owner? So again, another question to ask yourself, how often do you identify and manage customer needs? How often do you actually do surveys? And a survey could be a really formal written online survey, but it could also be informational interviews. I always encourage the small business owners that I work with to do non-sales interviews with prospects. What does that mean? It means go out and find you know, people whom you'd like to be able to sell to and just make an appointment to talk to them to identify their needs. Do not try to sell anything to them because when you are in a market research phase, you'll get a lot more information, a lot more value because they'll be more open. You're not going to be worried, oh, now they're about to sell me something. And make it clear, this is not a sales activity. I will not sell you anything. Even if you beg me, I won't sell you anything. I'm really trying to identify needs. Very important. There's also lots of ways for you to do research online. You can do focus groups. You could do exit interviews after a customer is no longer engaged with your business or a prospect decides not to buy from you. Lots of ways to uncover information. But one thing to keep in mind is the power of no. 
I always love this quote from Steve Jobs. You know, Jobs, I'm actually as proud of the things we haven't done. Innovation is saying no to a thousand things. What does that mean? It means to really be cutting edge, you have to be focused. You have to know where you're going, and you can't get distracted from all the other things and opportunities that might appear. There's um, uh, a diagnosis I've come up with uh, called opportunity distraction disorder. It's not a real uh, ailment, but it is something that I'm quite convinced most entrepreneurs suffer from because unless you're focused, uh, then it's very easy to see what else is out there. And just like um, if you were going on a trip from, let's say, the east coast of the U.S. to the west coast, there are a thousand ways to get there. And sure, you can, you can take different routes, but you have to figure out what's most direct and which is the one that's going to get me there in the most efficient amount of time. Because you can dilly-dally and a year later show up at the other end of the coast and, you know, it's not exactly what you're hoping for. So what's the treatment for this? It's having a roadmap. It's really being clear about your goals. Okay, so we've talked about market research as an important aspect about business. Let's talk about product development. And when we talk about product development, it's not just creating new products, but it's making sure your operations are aligned so that you can actually achieve the success you're looking for. You know, one of the things we understand as businesses grow, your role is constantly evolving. Basically, you go from doing all the work, if you've just launched a company, to teaching others how to do the work, to then managing for desired results, and then sort of managing the context. And you're very far removed at that point. And if your business is sincerely growing through very strong layers um, and stages, then these change, but it changes your focus as well. So you need to about, think about what stage you're in, and do you have the systems in place? Do you have the management styles that you need? That means, you know, do you need, are you a control freak, so to speak? Do you like to manage everything? Well, that may uh, prohibit your company from actually growing. So how do you let go? How do you allow others to make decisions? You have to put processes and systems in place because those will allow you to step back and be able to oversee what people are doing but not micromanage because that's truly the only way a small business can scale. Okay, let's talk about number three, sales outreach. Of course, you're familiar with selling, especially if you're the owner of the business. Small business owners always have to sell. But keep in mind, sales is about benefits. Right? So great salespeople understand truly what their customers need, but not on a gut level. Right? And you may have a gut instinct, but confirming it, making sure you know what their need is, and then selling or promoting, giving them the opportunity to buy from you, is all about what I call the so what factor, meaning if you explain to them what you can offer them, and they come back and say, well, so what? What's it mean to me? Then you haven't done a good job explaining the benefits, the value proposition. And so as a great salesperson, you need to understand that because the more you understand that, the more it lends to being able to develop new products or new services and to really be able to expand what you're doing. Of course, there's so many opportunities now in terms of selling, customer engagement, but what I always remind people is you may have lots of new tools out there, such as the web and social media, but you've got to follow the same old rules, meaning figure out where your customers are, where they're finding information about you, about your competitors, make sure you understand the value proposition, and that's the only places you should be engaging. So should you be on Pinterest, which is some of you may not be familiar as a site which is all, you know, you pin images basically. Well, if you're a great visual company, if you sell artwork, sure, Pinterest makes sense. If you sell services, what are you going to pin up, right? And so you need to evaluate each of these individuals because they appear to be free, but there's a huge cost involved in terms of your time. So think about looking at 
you know, should you do YouTube videos? Hey, that might make sense. Should you be on LinkedIn? In my opinion, every business, a small business person should be on LinkedIn. Should you be tweeting? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. You need to decide, again, based on your customers and your value proposition. So let's talk about having a unique value proposition. That's all about your brand. What's their customer experience working with you? What do they benefit from and why do they value you? Because brands fulfill many needs. You've got to make sure yours aligns with your customers. So sometimes brands fulfill some type of short-term need, meaning, you know, you trust this organization, and so you need to go out and buy, uh, maybe you need a new car, and you trust a certain brand. Well, that's where you should go. Or maybe there's some type of emotional connection to the brand that you really feel loyal or they do, they do good, right? There are some um, beauty products where the companies are known for doing good. You want to be affiliated with that. Could be you buy a brand because they're, it's hot, it's in vogue, it's very cool. You know, you want the latest and greatest, so maybe it's a clothing line. Or maybe it represents who you are or who you want to be. So, for example, um, uh, you may want to be affiliated with a certain car manufacturer because um, maybe you want a Mercedes because it really promotes the image of who you are, what position you've achieved or risen to, or who you want to be. So think about that and think about how you can make your brand resonate in people's minds. So remember, your brand must be sticky. I always encourage people to take out a sticky note, and you can do this, you know, when this session is over, and think of a three-word sentence that describes your brand value. And so I'll give you an example. I mentioned before I do a lot of market research for clients. But if I came into a meeting and I said, oh, I can do market research for you, well, honestly, that's not very exciting. Nobody really cares about market research. But if I say to them, I can help you accelerate client growth or, or improve customer loyalty, they might say, well, how would you go about doing that? Because that's intriguing to them. And then I might tell them, I do it because I can do market research and find out why customers buy from you. So there's a difference. You've got to have this, it's almost like a tagline, but really it should be even more powerful. It should be a three or maybe you need a five-word sentence, but something that's brief that describes your value proposition in terms of how it, the other person will value that. So I hope we can keep the dialogue going. I have um, a blog in R that, you know, per- completely free that I always encourage people to log on to. I just completed a 90-day business accelerator program um, because my blog in R is basically a seminar in the form of a blog. And so if you go on to Lucky by Design blog, you can read the 90 days of business growth webinar seminar. Or I have a newsletter. Again, um, you can send me a text to subscribe, um, or you can go to my website, m-edge.com, completely free. Um, And I hope we'll get to stay in touch and keep the dialogue going. So with that, I'm thrilled to turn this over to Gloria um, to continue talking about how this applies to federal contracting. Thanks so much. Beth, I am so excited about this, and I know Steve gave me a fabulous introduction earlier. I wanted everybody to know we stuck my intro slide here so you know a little bit more about me. But let's go ahead and jump right into lucky and successful marketing tactics for government contracts and contractors. You know, as Beth was talking about the whole concept of creating your own luck it really does apply to the federal marketplace very well. And this is creating your own luck. When you do this, follow the processes of solid, successful marketing tactics. So first of all, you want to target the government agencies that care about your brand. That is easier said than done. So what is your brand? Are you a solutions provider? And what really does that mean to the target? 
do the decision makers embrace what you're saying or are they hearing you say the same thing that everybody else says and are they really understanding the differentiator in your brand that's something that we're going to talk a little bit more about we will focus in on some specific federal contracting branding tools that you'll want to use so i'm going to go into detail about that over the next few minutes and how to beat the rush. This is really getting lucky before the RFP is issued. If you know how to set the stage before that RFP comes out, you can be the, quote, lucky, unquote, winner of the contract. And then we'll cover a few mistakes to avoid as well in the federal contracting market. So first, in targeting government agencies that care about your brand, you want to identify, does that agency buy exactly what you sell? And what do I mean by that? It, it sounds obvious, but it's not obvious because I see contractors and I get feedback from decision makers that contractors waste their time by showing up for a valuable face-to-face -face meeting, and the first thing they ask the decision maker is, so what do you need? And that is a sure way to destroy any luck you may have had at that particular office or decision maker because they want you to do your research first so that you can be informed and you know what they're buying ahead of time and not only what they're buying, but that they're buying exactly what you're selling. That way they will not be irritated with you and they'll be more apt to listen to what you have to tell them. In targeting the agencies or military bases and understanding what they do creates luck for you. How do I mean that? Well, Imagine if you're targeting the Department of Health and Human Services and Fort Detrick, you need to talk to each one of these targets differently because they're interested in different missions. They have different missions. Health and Human Services performs one group of services related to the health of the citizens of the United States, whereas Fort Detrick performs a very different range of services. So if you can speak to how your products or services match the mission of the target, you'll start seeing your luck improve. Will they value your differentiators? Well, let me give you a simple differentiator that many people don't really uh, use enough, and that's geographic. If you're targeting Fort Detrick and you happen to be located within 30 miles of Fort Detrick, that can be a huge differentiator if your competitors are located on the West Coast or in Texas or in Florida. So if the target values doing business with people who are located in their backyard. That can be a solid differentiator for you. And again, your luck will start to improve. Do you know the layers of decision makers? There are three basic layers. There's many, many layers, but you can generally describe them in three different ways. The first one are the small business folks, the second one are the contracting and acquisition team, and the third layer are the program managers or end users. Each one of those layers of people are interested in different messages from you. They want to know different uh, information from you. If you know the layers of decision makers, guess what? Luck starts increasing. And most importantly, how do they know you? Are you sending them your capability statements? Are you meeting them at the vendor outreach sessions? Are you talking their language? You, do you know what they have coming up with opportunities? All of these 
elements play into solidifying your brand so that then you can start seeing your luck improve. Let's talk a little bit about the specific federal contracting branding tools. These tools will help you be better known within the federal government. And I start off with CCR, CCR ccr.gov. You know, a lot of folks take it for granted. Oh, yeah, we're there. We registered there. And, you know, once a year we go in and and say we still still are the, the same company. But when we do our analysis, we find that over 60% of companies have either inaccurate or invalid data or they don't have all of the data elements filled out, one of which is your website. Talk about a branding tool. I can't tell you how many CCR records we see on a regular basis that don't even have the website of the company noted. How terrible is that? And the other elements that people who left, they, you may have the wrong contact information in there if someone is no longer at your company. Or your company may have grown, and instead of having one person's name for all of the points of contact, you now should have three or four or five or six, depending on what their levels of responsibilities are. So make sure your registrations, your basic registrations, like your CCR record, are thoroughly filled out and up to date. Your Small Business Dynamic Search, SBDS, remember that's how they find you. CCR is how you get paid. Small Business Dynamic Search is how you are found. It is the marketing tool, a free registration within the government marketplace that many small businesses don't know anything about. Your ORCA, O-R-C-A, ORCA record, it doesn't have anything to do with a whale. What it does have to do is your online representations and certifications application. This is where you will legally represent whether you're a small business, a minority-owned, woman-owned, hub-zone, veteran-owned, etc. But let me tell you about this next one, PIRS, P-P-I-R-S dot gov. This is where your scorecard is. This is where your government customers will grade you pertaining to the type of services or products that you're providing, A, B, C, D, F. And if you haven't looked at your PEEPERS record, you need to go there today and see what it says because that's the first place a decision maker will go if they're seriously considering you for an upcoming opportunity. And then Agencies have their own databases. Prime contractors have their own databases. So you'll want to go, if you're targeting the uh, Department of Homeland Security, you'll want to check out what vendor databases they have. Same thing with Health and Human Services, Department of the Interior. And absolutely, positively, you want to be in the Fort Detrick Business Development Office database. It's extraordinarily important for you to be there. So these federal contracting branding tools all work together to tell your targets that you know the market, that you're established in the market, and that you're ready to work with them. Now, if anyone has ever heard of TargetGov before, you know we are the capability statement experts. So you must have a powerful one-page capability statement. And the Fort Detrick Business Development Office has a fabulous webinar that you can listen to at your convenience that will tell you everything you need to know about creating a powerful one-page CAPE statement for yourself. Your website should be very, very clear with a federal contracting focus. Have a tab, a page, uh, an icon that says government contracting on it so that the federal market will understand that you know this market and are prepared to be successful in it. 
And Beth Goldstein is really one of the experts on creating a great elevator pitch. And I've tweaked it a little to call it a matchmaking pitch. Because in the federal government, you use your elevator pitch during matchmaking events. So check with Beth. Find out her rules for creating a great elevator pitch and then apply it to the federal government as a matchmaking pitch and your brand will be very, very solid. A little bit more information here on your capability statement. It is the most powerful door opener you can have and use in the federal government. If you have a strong one, doors will open. If you have a weak capability statement, you're going to find that doors just stay closed. People don't return your emails, they don't return your phone calls, and you're not going to know why. If you're not presenting yourself well in this document, which is a mandatory document in this marketplace, you're really hurting yourself, shooting yourself in the foot, so to speak. So there are five key elements to it. First of all, call it a capability statement. Put those two words right at the top, either right before or right after the company logo and name. The CAPE statement that you see a little icon for on your screen right now for Patriot Taxiway Industries, this is a small business that went from zero to $7 million in sales in less than one year. And this is their actual capability statement. I know it's a little small to read. If you want to shoot me an email, I'll be happy to send you the complete CAPE statement. But my point is they grew their company with this document reflecting what they provide. One side of one piece of paper, that is liv livable, meaning it changes depending on who the targets are. You'll change the uh, verbiage if you're targeting the Army will have different verbiage than if you're targeting Health and Human Services. And it will have different ver verbiage if you're targeting the VA. So each one of your CAPE statements should be specific to the targeted agencies. And it will also include your core competencies. This is really your uh, abilities and expertise. It's not everything you can do. It's your claim to fame, your secret sauce, so to speak. Because the government doesn't want to know that you everything you can do. They want to know exactly what you can do that I need right now. That's really the key. So it's much better to have one or two core competencies that relates to exactly what they need than to have a whole laundry list of things that you can do that they don't need. Past performance, number three. Past performance is really the money maker here because remember the government is risk adverse. Past performance mitigates risk in doing business with your company. Now, you can have past performance with the private sector, business-to-business -business customers. It doesn't always have to be with the government as long as it's experience doing exactly what the government needs. That's really the magic to the whole idea of past performance. And if you have questions about this in the future, you can always get in touch with the Fort Detrick Business Development Office or shoot me an email. I'd be happy to answer it for you as well. Differentiators. You know, most companies fail to put down good differentiators. <laughs> what do I mean by that? They use, they'll say, say things like, we have great people. Our differentiator is our people. Well, who doesn't have great people? You never see anybody who says we have terrible people. So your differentiators really must be what makes you stand out from your competition, what solidifies your brand. And it is, it's not easy to come up with them, but once you start 
to crystallize in your own mind what your differentiators are, your prospects will understand them as well, and you'll start getting luckier. It's funny how that works. And notice company data is at the end. This is where you'll put what size company, if you're a specific socioeconomic certification, you're large or small, what your NAICS codes are, cage codes, etc. Put all of that at the end. So this capability statement is really one of the most powerful branding tools and door openers that you can use. From a website standpoint, a good website will be clearly branded with your logo, the style that's reflected in your other collateral materials such as your business cards and your CAPE statement. It will also mention the contract vehicles that you use. Now, this may be a new term for some folks, but if you let me tell you what it is. A contract vehicle is how the government buys. It could be as simple as a credit card. A Visa or a MasterCard can be considered a contract vehicle. The government will never sign your contract. If you put a piece of paper down in front of them and say, here's everything I want to sell you, sign here and we'll, we're good to go, they'll just look at you like you have three eyes because that's never the way they buy. You must use their contracts, their documentation. And in order to simplify the process, a few of these vehicles can be pre-negotiated ahead of time, such as a GSA schedule or one of the IDIQs, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity, or as a whole out alphabet full or alphabet soup full of acronyms out there to describe what these contract vehicles are. You want to list them on your website. Your core competencies, past performance differentiators, notice the same words. You actually want to use these terminologies on your website so that you're speaking the government language. But on a website, you also have the luxury of more space. You don't have to limit it to one side of one piece of paper. So you can tell your story, use case studies, make white papers available via your website. That way, you can really appeal to those program managers and end users who are really interested in finding out how you do what you do so that they can determine if it will help them. And bottom line, please, no music or video on your website unless you produce music or video. They're the only companies that should have music or video on your website. Otherwise, it's considered a waste of time, and it's the quickest way to get someone to leave your website is to blast out music, even if it's a jazzy kind of music. Take my word for it. Just don't have it on your website. It does not appeal to the government contracting market unless you produce music or videos. Then that's a different story. Now, getting lucky before the RFP is issued, remember about those three layers of decision makers. If you can identify them ahead of time, Contact them, <clears throat> develop a relationship with them, then you have a better shot of actually getting a meeting with them and appealing to their needs that they have. If you know the budget and you've checked their forecast for upcoming opportunities, You'll be able to speak intelligently about their needs. They'll be impressed. If you have answered sources, sought notices, these always come out before the RFP is issued. Smart and lucky companies will answer the sources, sought notices, and become much better familiar 
with the actual opportunity, the requirements, the decision makers, this is a perfect time to reach out to the contracting and acquisition folks as well as the program managers to discuss the sources sought notice when you see that posted. <clears throat> and depending on whether or not the opportunity is under 25000 or over 25000 this will help you plan your strategy as to whether or not you're going to be the lucky bidder. What do I mean by that? If it's under 25000 this opportunity will never be advertised anywhere. The only way you'll get lucky and get a chance to bid on it is if that decision maker knows who you are. So you can stack the deck in your favor by reaching out to this decision maker ahead of time, building a relationship with them, sending them your capability statement, asking for a capability briefing so that when they have a need, they know who you are. Once it goes over $25,000, this opportunity must be advertised somewhere. And lately, we've seen advertising opportunities on Twitter, on LinkedIn, as well as the traditional places like FedBizOps and GSA eBuy. So some of those folks who are getting lucky on answering bids are doing it because they're seeing them advertised in unique places like Twitter and LinkedIn. Having the preferred contract vehicle, if a buyer says, I'm going to use a GSA schedule, and you don't have a GSA schedule, you'll never get lucky and win that because they require it. So having understanding first what a contract vehicle is and then having what they're using, whether it's a credit card, a GSA schedule, or another vehicle, is the only way that you'll be able to bid and win on that opportunity. And bottom line, building relationships. This is a relationship-based market. The companies that are the luckiest companies and have the highest revenues from the U.S. federal government are those that understand that relationships are critical in this market. And they're um, legitimate built on trust, and they, the reason is that the government decision makers are under requirements not to do business with risky businesses. So the more they know you, the more they trust you, the more often they see you, the longer of a relationship they have with you, the better your shots are of getting lucky and winning business. So, with that being said, I think we might be able to take a few questions, Steve. Yeah, thank, thanks, Gloria, and thank you, Beth. You both have packed in such a large amount of information, of great information in such a short webinar. So this is terrific. And we have uh, a lot of questions that have come in. Uh, we probably can't get to all of them. So I'd like to remind everyone that if we don't get to your question, we will respond in an email. And for those who are listening to this in the future as a recording, uh, uh, please send your questions, continue sending questions, to the email address at the bottom of the screen. It's ask at fdbdo.com, and, then, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll address it with an answer. So uh, let's get started with a couple of these questions. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, first one. Beth, this one is for you. Uh, how much luck is really involved in federal business development? That's a great question. I think I'm going to turn that over to Glory, who really is the expert in federal business development. Oh, Beth, you're too kind, because the whole premise of this relies has nothing to do with pure luck. It's reverse engineering your luck. And I love the way you started off this entire webinar by talking about that, Beth. The, the idea of building a strategy and the related tactics that will 
open up doors at the right timing for you. Just like the guy who took advantage of the the ice dams and his business skyrocketed, and he didn't even realize he reverse engineered it because he built a website who had search engine optimization for ice dams. You know, in the federal government, you can use that same example. If you reverse engineer your website to have search engine optimization for the key words that the government's using on contract opportunities, guess what? Your website's going to come up. You're going to be known as the kind of company that has the services or products that they're looking for. So, Beth, if you wanted to add anything on the ways to reverse engineer, that could be helpful. I'd be happy to. And actually, um, reverse engineering is more of a, a mindset. It's, you know, we can't see into the future and know what opportunities are going to happen, but we can control the now. And the best way to control the now is to almost go back into the past and say, let me grab or think about three or four times when I had these amazing opportunities seemingly land in my lap. What did I do to be prepared for them? And when you start to reverse engineer your own good luck, and if you start to reverse engineer your bad luck, hey, what was I not able to get because I hadn't done X, Y, and Z? When you start to look at those things, then you say, ah, here are the activities I need to be doing, and here are the activities I need to be avoiding. Right? And so reverse engineering is going into the past, figuring out what you did right to get and seize and recognize really great opportunities, and then taking that and projecting those so that the future ones that happen, you'll be ready for. All right. Good. Uh, I've got another one. Um, this one has to do with, it looks like the social media. Uh, does the government use social marketing sites? I'd like to grab that one. And the comment I made earlier about Twitter and LinkedIn, you know, honestly, I was pretty surprised when I first saw some of the opportunities being posted on social media sites. But the rules state that if an opportunity exceeds $25,000, that it must be posted on a public site. It doesn't say, or public access. Um, it could be a uh, Fed Biz Ops, which is a, the government posting online website, or it could be anything at all. It could even be posted on the wall of the building. Uh, but now that since 9-11 happened and we can't walk in the door at, freely anymore, they're using the Internet much more frequently. So individual agencies have really embraced the whole social media world. Uh, Specifically, Twitter and LinkedIn are two of the strongest at this point for posting, potentially posting contracting, actual contracting opportunities. Um, And we're seeing them starting to use some others as well. So all I can say is if you want to get lucky (laughs) uh, by using social media, you want to take a hard look at those two sites. Gloria, that's fascinating. I I just have to ask, how do you post an opportunity in 140 characters? Is it like a teaser and then they link you to another site? Exactly. Okay. Yes. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) All right. Okay, well, um, we do have other questions, but I'm going to just – we will get back. We will answer those questions in an email, and I want to remind everyone – uh, if you're listening to this webinar in a recording, uh, uh, please um, send your questions to the email address, ask at fdbdo.com, you know, anytime, 24 hours, seven days a week, and, and we'll respond with an answer. So um, um, great job, everyone. Great job, uh, Beth and, and, and Gloria. And uh, I want to mention that, that to be successful in federal contracting, it's important to know the resources that are available to us to help us be successful. And today, we have three resources that are providing this webinar. We have Marketing Edge Consulting Group with, with, with Beth and, and, and Target Gov with Gloria, and we have the Fort Detrick Business Development Office. And the Fort Detrick Business Devel- Development Office specializes in those agencies and programs and commands all at Fort Detrick. 
we help companies navigate through the through Fort Detrick to help them match up those pros, prospective customers with their products or services. And we also provide training to those companies that have no federal contracting experience. Uh, if those companies that register with our office, well, then we send them solicitations out of Fort Detrick. So you have to be registered with our office to receive this type of information, and you can register with the Fort Detrick Business Development Office at www.fdbdo.com. So on behalf of the Fort Detrick Business Development Office, I want to thank our speakers, Gloria Larkin and Beth Goldstein, for making this presentation on federal contracting possible today. So thank you, ladies. And our pleasure. Until, <laughs> until next time, everyone, uh, so long, and uh, have a great day. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>